everybody, and welcome to our continuing coverage of the 1987 U.S. Olympic Festival. We are into our final weekend of coverage, and we are definitely saving some of the best for last. We are back again at the Dean Smith Center, the site of the gymnastics competition. Last night, you saw a young man named Neil Palmer from the University of Nebraska win the men's all-around, and the North team win the team title in gymnastics. Well, tonight we're going to have an opportunity to take a look at the women. And we have some outstanding young women coming up for you to see in competition. These are women, Jim, as you know, between the ages of 20 and about 14. And, of course, let me first introduce Jim Kelly, who has joined us. Certainly not between the ages of 14 and 20. But, uh, yeah, really. <laughs> but they are the women that we're going to see in the festival in 1992. I mean, in the Olympics in 1992 and uh, some outstanding young gymnasts. Oh, it's terrific, and they are so tiny and so fragile, <laughs> yet they are power-packed and every ounce is muscle. There's no fat on any of these young gymnasts back here. We will also be going to the initial action as far as track and field. Terrific names have come out of the past festivals in track and field. Names like Edwin Moses and, of course, Carl Lewis, which reminds you of Houston, and that was the site of the festival last year. You might recall where Jackie uh, Joyner Kersey uh, in very hot and humid weather, broke her own world mark in the heptathlon, a mark that she had, she had set just a couple of weeks before in the World University Games over in Moscow. So we'll be seeing some of the heptathlon tonight, and of course the initial action in track and field as well. So it's a big night. One of the things to watch here will be the weather, too, because it's about 110 degrees on the floor of the track the stadium. So that will be a factor for these athletes. We'll continue. Don't go away. The 1987 U.S. Olympic Festival is brought to you by Bud Light, the light beer with the first name and taste. Everything else is just a light. Adidas, proud to support amateur athletics as an official sponsor of the 1987 Olympic Festival. Neo Sporin, for faster healing, it's the one. McDonald's, it's a good time for the great taste of McDonald's. and welcome to the first of our three nights of coverage of track and field on ESPN. We'll not only be here tonight, we'll be here Saturday afternoon and evening, Sunday afternoon and evening, all the way through the closing ceremonies. The story so far has been the heat at 1.30 this afternoon. It was 102 degrees air temperature, 120 degrees down here at the track level. Right now it's a rather comfortable 84 degrees, and we'll keep you posted on the weather details all the way through. As usual, covering track and field for us on ESPN, Marty LaCorey and Larry Rossi. Let's go upstairs to them right now. Well, Mike, this entire year is a hot one for track and field. The World Championships just about a month away, and the top athletes that are here are using this as a tune-up heading towards the end of the season in the big World Championships. So we've had surprises, Larry, right till the last minute here. And as usual at an American track meet, speed is of the essence. The 200 meters here will be great. Marty, it will be. And we had a surprise in the women's 200 meters. Evelyn Ashford, who has had some leg miseries, as you know, uh, has chosen not to run. Her leg is not ready. But replacing her, Valerie Briscoe. So we go from an American record holder and world record holder at 100 meters to the American record holder at 200 meters. Briscoe's in the race. The men's 200, by the way, I might add here, there's no wind. They like hot weather. And we have the former number one ranked 200 meter runner in the world, James Butler, in the race. And we have two Olympic bronze medalists from the 1976 games, Dwayne Evans, and from 1984, Thomas Jefferson. All three have a time within four one-hundredths of a second, all-time best at 200 meters. We should see some great races tonight. Well, it's been hot here, but it's 85 now. Perfect weather for sprinting. Brand new track here. We're looking forward to a terrific three days. We began the day here at Wallace Wade Stadium with a heptathlon. It's a seven-event grind for the women, starting off with the 100-meter hurdles. Also on today's schedule, the high jump, the shot put in the 200 meters. Then they get a break and go to tomorrow with the long jump, the javelin, and round it out with the 800 meters. Points are awarded in each event based on a comparison with international standards, and the most points total for all seven events wins the heptathlon. So right now, let's take you back to about 4.30 this afternoon, and the first event 
invented the heptathlon, the 100-meter hurdles, and the call of the race from Marty LaCorey and Larry Rawson. Well, the world record in the hurdles, 12.64, and starting in lane one of this competition, That is Natalie Liu of the South. Starting next to her in lane two will be Pam Connell. In lane three, one of the athletes with a chance to win here, Kathy Tyree. Sharon Fister will be in lane number four. And in lane five, one of the better hurdlers, Sheila Tarr. Lane six will be Jill Lancaster. In lane seven, Anita Sarton. And in lane eight, Terry Turner, who was the world record holder in the triple jump. And this is her second year, Larry, in the heptathlon. She's had some good success at it. She has, Marty. One thing about Tyree, uh, she has finished sixth in the TAC heptathlon earlier, just about a month ago, and has run very well in this event in the past. And they are off with uh, Kathy Tyree taking the lead over the first two hurdles. Tyree in lane three with the lead as Sheila Tarr in the center of the track moves up. She's a good hurdler. And in second will be Anita Sarton Birnbaum, who was married just two weeks ago. As Sheila Tarr will win the first event of the women's heptathlon. She's a good hurdler. And uh, she ran well tonight, Larry. How prophetic that she wins the race here. Her last name, T-A-R-R. Uh, track bus from way back, may remember, 1964 Olympian Jerry Tarr. That is Jerry's daughter who won this race, and he was a very fine uh, high hurdler. One of the top five in the world in 1963 for a period of time, went on her pro football career. Watch her form over the hurdle. She gains and shows her techniques in the middle. She was not quick out of the blocks. She is the biggest woman in the heptathlete field. Five feet 11, 160 pounds. She splits the hurdle well. Watch her form. Her upper body, she keeps it under very fine control, and she really won that in the middle of the race with her technique. Well, Jill Attar took a while to get going, but she won it. Anita Bairnbaum second, and Kathy Tyree will get third. In the men's hammer throw, it's the world record of Yuri Sadiq at 284 feet. Imagine taking a 16-pound ball on a 4-foot chain, staying in a 7-foot circle, and heaving that thing 80 yards, just like that, down range. That's Tim Driscoll with his second throw, and he's going to be out there uh, with a second throw of about 207. The young man from Yale University threw that ball 73 yards. Let's watch the technique across the circle. You must keep the balance. Centrifugal force helps that. The legs do the leading and the hammer throw. Jim Driscoll's throw, 220. And this is Mike Fritchman from Cal State in Bakersfield for his second throw. Marty, this event goes back to the Talkian Games in Ireland back in the 16th century and got incorporated into track and field in England early on. Well, Frischman's throw is going to be 214.11. 214 feet, 11 inches. Watch him through the circle. Most of these men are over six feet tall. They weigh about 280 pounds. Four speed, four turns. He does. He must stay in that circle. You cannot step over the bar. Look at him. Try and walk it through. And talk it through, Marty. Next up, the man with the longest throw coming into the competition at 249.8, Lance Deal. Well, the 1984 Mont Montana State grad has been throwing well here today. 229 is not his best, but it's early here in the competition. Each athlete gets six throws here in the final. Watch his technique here. The ball can be started outside the circle or in. Notice the legs leading the upper part of the body. And you actually use it and create a whip-like motion that the upper torso follows the legs. Look how the knees are coming around. Arms extended, knees bent. And Lance Steele takes the lead after two rounds in the hammer, 229 feet, six inches. Let's go down now to Mike. We're at Wallace Wade Stadium at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, and we'll be back with more of our coverage of the Olympic Sports Festival in just a moment.
two is brought to you by Bartles and James Premium Wine Cooler Company. Taekwondo is a 2,000 years old Korean martial art. Nowadays, this is Olympic sports. Yeah! We practice one hour a day at my U.S. Taekwondo Center, and we do about 20 minutes warm-up exercise. That warm-up exercise designed by myself not only for Taekwondo, but also any other sports. And it's excellent for everything. Flexibility and balance and many, many good things. Taekwondo is uh, exactly like a boxing match. Three minutes, three rounds. And we kick to the body, kick to the face, but we do not punch to the face because it's easy to punch to the face. Kicking is three times powerful than punching. That's why we emphasize more kicking. And leg is much longer than hands. So it's a very, very good for uh, self-defense also. And people think uh, Taekwondo uh, is only uh, kicking and punching. But Taekwondo teaches discipline and respect. He emphasizes respect towards parents, respect towards everyone actually. Uh, he wants everyone to respect themselves and really teaches people to be um, better people. Screening we call kihap. Kihap is very, very good for concentration and power and spirit. If Taekwondo practitioners train very hard for many years, that screaming will come out automatically. If you get uh, over fourth degree black belt, we can call master. Ninth degree black belt is highest rank in Taekwondo. I am seventh degree black belt. I have to study more uh, this art of Taekwondo. Master Sang Lee, 13 time Korean national champ in Taekwondo. He is the coach of the Olympic and the Pan Am team. He is a seventh degree black belt in Taekwondo. And there is just none better than that on the face of the earth. Ninth degree is the best you can be, but nobody is that because it's perfection. At least no one around right now. And it's a, really a fascinating sport to watch. And much of it, though, it's more than a sport, Jim. As you know, it's, it's really a way of life to these people who practice Taekwondo. And I think much emphasized by the beginning of each match, and you will be seeing some a little bit later on, they bow. And uh, the purpose of that is really to show the personal humility that they feel and respect for oneself and one another. And that's the emphasis of that sport. And as you know, there are eight weight classes, and there are four competitors that figure into each weight class. Taekwondo, they say, an under-publicized but also an underdeveloped sport. Back in 1984, there were only 3,400 Taekwondo specialists in the United States. Now there are over 18,000 with 800 Taekwondo schools. They, of course, practice the art of self-defense. It's used for confidence building and, believe it or not, also for weight loss. And Mike Weintraub, who's the executive director of the Taekwondo Association, said he would be happy to put any Taekwondo specialist into the ring with any pro karate specialist because he says Taekwondo is martial art, not martial sport, which he thinks that's what pro karate is. The gymnasts are getting set behind us here. The young women gymnasts, some of the best from our junior national team. They'll be in action when we come right back.
If you like action and excitement aplenty, stay with us on ESPN because we're at the Taekwondo venue here at the Raleigh Civic Center. Hello, everyone. I'm Tom Meads along with Michael Weintraub, the uh, executive director of the U.S. Taekwondo Union. Michael, you uh, have reason to be a happy man tonight. You have a sellout crowd here in Raleigh. You've got a great sport, and it's the sport that will be the host sport at the Summer Games in Seoul. Yes, since our admittance as a Group A member to the U.S. Olympic Committee, we've grown over 500% in registered members. We've been selling out venue after venue, and the public is coming to see Taekwondo thanks to ESPN, and hopefully thanks to others in the future. But we are used to sell out crowds now, and the action will be starting soon, and it'll be fast and furious as usual. Michael, you are a very busy man. I think the key reason why is one word, growth. This sport is growing at an incredible rate. 500% in under two years. In, just in terms of registered members, we anticipate further growth. People are now understanding the difference between us which is an under-publicized, not an underdeveloped sport, and similar martial arts, which are actually not similar at all, and we'll show you how, I think, tonight. All right, the sport of Taekwondo and the free fighting aspect of it divided into eight weight classes. We'll see gold medals awarded both tonight and tomorrow night as our coverage of the Taekwondo competition continues. As we mentioned to you last night, the top 11 men and women in gymnastics are not here. People like Christy Phillips and Scott Johnson, they are right now in preparation for the Pan American Games. The young men and women here at the festival are the juniors. They are the youngsters, the ones that you will see and probably see most of these people in the 1992 Olympics. They are excellent. The women range in age from about 14 to 20 years. You're going to see them now. So let's join Bart Con Connor and Tim Brando with Women's Gymnastics. Welcome to the first rotation of the women's gymnastics all around here at the Dean Smith Center at the University of North Carolina. I'm Tim Brando along with Bart Connor and Megan Fenton, only 14 years of age, 95 pounds of her from Sandy, Utah, on the balance beam. Born in Seoul, Korea, will be a freshman at Union Middle School in the fall. How ironic. Born in Seoul in 73, competes for Rocky Mountain Gymnastics and is coached by Mark Lee. She mounts with a press to a handstand and a really nice stag position and then lowers to a planche in that stag position and presses back up. It's a very impressive balance sequence. Shows good strength. There's the full turn, which is a requirement on the beam. Really, oh, unfortunately, that was really a very nicely done swing through layout backflip. It looked to me that she threw it off right off the side, right from the beginning. You can see she's wearing that knee brace, and so it's possible that she's favoring her knee a little bit. She did a very nice combination of leaps. The judges are looking for more difficult combination tumbling, and there's a nice combination. Back handspring through to a layout. This is really only her third major competition, Bart. And speaking of that, I think she's a little tentative right here. She isn't really attacking, and it's understandable. This is a big meet. It's got to be scary out there. On the vault, Robin Richter. Whoa, what a bounce on the landing there. She did a really nice layout, Tsukahara. That was her first. Now, what they'll do in the all-around, they get two vaults, and they'll take the best score of the two vaults. They don't combine the scores as they will in the individuals come Sunday. And she is very powerful. You can see here, she comes onto the horse. She really gets a good push. She is up there. Nice position in the air. <laughs> Remember, she's got to stick that landing if she wants the perfect score. In that case, she took a hop, maybe a tenth of a point deduction. Robin out of Lincoln, Nebraska, the Nebraska School of Gymnastics, just 15 years old. 13, 14, and 15 will be the rule rather than the exception tonight. Participated in a couple of uh, international events in 86, the Switzerland-Holland-USA meet where she placed fifth in the all-around, and the Pacific Alliance meet where the United States team finished second. She placed fourth in the uneven bars and eighth in the all-around. So... For a youngster, she's been around, particularly in the last year and a half. Absolutely. Now, keep in mind, she did her first vault, and she took a little bit of a hop on the landing. She's going to now try and do, I believe she's doing the same vault. She was just a little over-rotated. She wants to pull that around and see if she can nail the landing. Oh, 
Oh, okay. That was actually a better vault. She landed much higher in the chest when she did meet the floor. She did take a hop, but that will score better. She had an outstanding performance with us in Houston at the festival. She plays third in the all-around. Here it is again. Yeah, this time she really comes around. Good position in the air. She's really pulling over the top there in that layoff position. And look how high she landed. That's going to score well. Now to the uneven bars where Juliet Bangader, four feet, 11 inches tall, just 84 pounds, prepares out of Scottsdale, Arizona. That's the home office, right? Letterman's home office, Scottsdale, out of a Desert Devils Gymnastics Club. This is her first year of internationals competition as well. She's actually a specialist in the compulsory exercises. She was third in the junior nationals this past year, and much of her success is due to her excellent technique and her excellent body line. Let's see on her optional exercises how well she can do here. Everyone's been talking about her in the last few days as they've been working out, but as you told us in our meeting earlier today, this is the first time America has had an opportunity to see her, so she may go a long way in determining her fate of the future with this first performance on national television right now. Nice cast to a handstand. Good giant swing. She has good momentum and a nice reverse hack. That's one of the big release moves being done these days. Beautiful work on the slaughter. So far, she has a really nice fluid swing. She's a little breaking a little form on the giant swing. But what a stick on the dismount. Nice tuck double back. She loves it. The eighth grader at Pueblo Junior High School. Loves swimming, water skiing, and shopping. So watch out. Guys, she loves to shop. <laughs> okay, you can see she casts a handstand. She loses, breaks form a little bit, and she's a little loose in the back on the giant swing. But this double back is done really high. Look at, she is up there, and she knows how to spot the landing. On to the floor exercise now. Dana Dabronski, 15 years old from Bloomville Hills, Michigan, representing the North team. Okay, she's setting up for her first tumbling run. Here we go. Up the handspring, tuckable back. Nice, clean landing. Now, it's important to note that she really moves nicely. She has nice position here. Beautiful double turn. She's not doing the most difficult tumbling elements. If she wants to get the big score, she has to risk the full twisting double backs. But she's very clean. Look at the front step out through to a double full. No deductions. Very well done. But she really does have nice body line and extension. Good presentation. You can see that she's selling her performance, looking up into the audience as much as she can. She's an excellent beam work worker, and I'm hoping we'll have a chance to see her work beam later today. She, in fact, I believe, placed fourth in the U.S. Nationals on beam just about a month ago. Okay, here's the last tumbling run. Really nice, clean, oh. double twist. Like I mentioned earlier, not the most difficulty, but you can't deduct much for that because it's so perfectly done. Dana Dabronski competed in her first meet at 85 at the Maccabiah Games in Israel, captured the all-around there. There's her floor exercise score, 9.1. Megan Fenton on the balance beam, an 8.45. Richter, Robin Richter on the vault, her best out of the two, the 9.4. So that's the conclusion of our first rotation. Three more are on the way at this year's U.S. Olympic Festival all around. Stay with us. You're looking at Joyce Wilborn, who has to be considered one of the favorites for the all around. This is one of her prize packages, the vault. It's a real advantage for Joyce to be able to start this competition on one of her best events. Her vaulting power is unbelievable. Look at that ball. <laughs> Look at how far from the horse she landed. That was a laid out Sukuhara with a full twist. And she has a lot of juice. Let me tell you, she is up there. She twists clean and she gets tremendous distance. She won the bronze medal in the vault to earn the highest U.S. gymnastics finish at the Goodwill Games in Moscow. Has extensive international experience. Had a great 85 Olympic Festival in Baton Rouge. She was much younger then. Look at this position in the air. Straight body, laid out, full twist. 
Look how far from the horse she lands. She needs to stick that landing if she wants to get the perfect score, but that baby is up there. You say she's really the most explosive that we have in the field. I really believe so, and as she won that bronze medal in the Goodwill Games, it was because she just really nailed these vaults. Once again, layoff too full. Okay, a little bit less of a hop on the landing, so it's gonna score even better. She's been working on her degree of difficulty. She says that's what she needs to improve upon. She has good speed, but what's most important is the power right here. Boom, she is up there. Look at the position and the distance from the horse. And maybe a small hop on the landing. It's gonna score well. There's Sun Janap from Reading, Pennsylvania on the uneven bars. 14 years of age, 97 pounds. Uh, it was a beautiful release move. That's a move called a Jaeger. It's a straddle front flip invented by a German gymnast. Now, it's important to note that she's going to work both the high bar and the low bar. She can't spend too much time on the high bar, but wow, nice giant swings. And a couple of steps on the over-rotation of a double back, but otherwise a really nice exercise. She had a back problem, Bart, that really cost her a full year of competition. Otherwise, she might be right there among the top gymnasts in the world among the youngsters. And, of course, it doesn't matter how old or young you are in this sport. That's been proven many times over. We'll continue with more from the Women's Gymnastics All Around here at the U.S. Olympic Festival in just a few moments. What you're seeing is America's game, but only recently has our game been a part of the Olympic movement. Back in 1984 at the Olympics in Los Angeles, baseball was an exhibition sport and some of the big names in Major League Baseball today were a part of that Olympic team. Now as we head to 88, it will be a medal sport. And for these youngsters that you see behind me, a difficult choice must be made. Baseball won its way into the Olympic movement back in 84 at the Games of Los Angeles. It was there that amateur stars like Corey Snyder, Will Clark, Odeby McDowell, yes, even Mark McGuire, and B.J. Sturhoff paved the way for future Olympians. Now, these junior players at the festival have that chance, but the system is confusing and the choice always difficult. You have, you know, many people telling you what to do with, you know, go to, go to school and, and some people tell you go to the minor leagues and take the money and run. But, uh, you know, if you have to really sit down and, and weigh your thoughts and see what you really want to do. Ron Fraser of Miami, who's been credited with much of the growth of amateur baseball, knows all too well of the many options. He can uh, take, an ed take a co scholarship if he's capable of going to college. He has the academic abilities to go to college and, and uh, uh, play after his junior year or, or hopefully after he graduates. And he has that. And then, of course, if, if this thing is um, uh, with the Olympics and, and, like I said, is a gold medal sport and they put a lot of emphasis on it, that would be a great thrill, I think, for any young man to, to represent his country or to go into professional baseball. I mean, he, he does have a few options. Shortstop Tom Reddington, seen here number 11 in red of the West team, had one of those options. He was drafted in the third round and turned down $105,000, taking instead a scholarship to Arizona State. But the scholarship and getting an education does mean a lot to the many athletes here at the festival. I'm looking to go to school, you know, playing ball and that kind of stuff. And uh, if things come around with the Olympics, you know, it's something I will do. Hopefully the cooperation will be there next year if we qualify and, uh, and we send our, our strongest team as we can to the Olympics in 88. So this is our future in baseball. The decision is very difficult and the system is imperfect. We've chronicled that. But it's nice to know 
that these young athletes do have the opportunity for the Olympic gold. It's no longer an exhibition sport. Baseball will become a part of the Olympic movement, and that's a very nice fact to know come the year 1988. And of course, Barcelona could become the key word because that'll be the city that will host the Olympics in 1992, the first time that baseball is a medal sport. One thing that comes to mind, Gail, I think the fact that in football, you have a choice. You can uh, go to college, and of course, that's the farm system, if you will, to get into the National Football League. But that's the one and only choice that you've got. In baseball, you do have an option. You can play pro ball, get into the minor leagues, maybe make the jump right away, or you can go to college and then have a bit of a training ground. And you wonder, too, what kind of nicknames Chris Berman might come up with for the 6'3 right-hander from Charlotte, North Carolina, who was just outstanding as a senior in high school. He struck out 161 batters. His ERA is 0.84. His first name is Craig, but he spells it K-R-E-G Gresham. So Chris Berman will have to work on some nicknames. Craig Gresham? Right. Oh, get Chris working on that. Okay. We should also say to people that they do, they play baseball at the Olympic Festival at the Pan Am Games or wherever and the Olympics is a demonstration sport under what they call international rules. Of course, it's an American game, so the only international rule is that there's no DH, so basically they play by National League rules. The other two things is that they have to use an aluminum or a, or a graphite bat, and they have to wear the helmets with the double ear flaps to protect the kids. Okay, so that's how baseball works at the Olympic Festival. We're going to take a break. We're going to be back a little bit later on with track and field. And up next, gymnastics once again. So stay with us. We'll be right back. NFL on ESPN, four preseason games, eight regular season games, the Pro Bowl as well, and of course that first game between the Bears and the Dolphins at the new Joe Robbie Stadium in Miami. We've been watching the young female gymnasts in action, and if you perhaps remember back to the Olympic Festival in 1981, that took place in Syracuse, New York. That was the first time that Mary Lou Retton put herself on the map. That was the first gold medal that she ever won. Of course, you know what happened after that. Let's go back to Bart Connor and Tim Brando to look at the young women. Welcome back to the women's all-around. Tim Brando along with Bart Conner, and after one rotation, Joyce Wilborn, after a masterful vault, has the lead over Dana Lister. Juliet Bangader, just 13 years old, in third place. Nicole Young is in fourth with a 9-4-5. Suanna Wells, Robin Richter, Cheryl Dundas, and Michaeline Myers make out the rest of the top of our field, but three more rotations remain. On to the uneven bars, and Nicole Young is getting ready. 14 years of age, out of Blue Springs, Missouri. Another one of the youngsters, born in October of 1972, trains at the Great American Gymnastics Express for Coach Al Fong. Al Fong has been doing a terrific job in the Kansas City area with some really outstanding gymnasts. He had a good field of competitors at the U.S. Championships, which were in Kansas City about a month ago. And I think he has about four girls from his team that are competing in this event here. So he has a really deep team and good program. There. How are we doing uh, at the international level on the uneven bars, Bart, for the women? Well, it's hard to uh, match the expertise of Julianne McNamara, the great American gymnast, of course, who won the last Olympics. She was definitely the master of the uneven bars and has been for quite some time. We do have some young hotshots who do very well here, however. Okay, there's her mount. She touched the low bar. She goes up to the high bar. Really nice cast. Beautiful front. That's the move called the Jaeger. Straddled front. Now, I believe she was supposed to go over on that cast of handstand and pirouette, but she did a good job covering up. But look at she has really powerful cast of handstand. Nice giant swings. Two in a row, and a toe on front with a half, and a really nice landing. The crowd loved it here in North Carolina, better than 14,000 of them. In Kansas City, she was 31st in the all-around. 
at the McDonald's Gymnastics Championships. You can see here she has good speed, a little bit of a problem with bending her arms as she goes over the top on those giant swings. That will be a minor deduction, but look at the position there, and she is up there on that toe on front with a half. Now over to floor exercise, Cindy Tom from the Verdugo Gymnastics team out of West Covina, California, just 15 years old. She loves the vault. She won the gold medal at last year's festival in the team competition, just entering her sophomore year in high school. Now keep in mind that the judges are looking for, generally you'll see three very explosive tumbling runs, but the whole exercise must be very well incorporated with the music and pretty dance elements and combining full turns, double turns, like that one there, a change of pace, and of course, if it can be well coordinated with the music, it's definitely an advantage. Nice, clean, front step out to a tuck double back, and she did that very easily. She landed the double back as if no problem here. Okay, there's a roundup back handspring, tuck double back, back handspring, back layout. Nice combination tumbling. It's very unusual to see a gymnast who will work out of a tuck double back. Very difficult tumbling run. Okay, here's her last acrobatic tumbling pass. Nice high double twist. Nice routine. Seems much easier for the crowds to relate to the floor exercise. They got a good one there from Cindy Tom. Now let's go over to track and field. Mike Patrick, Marty LaCorey, and Larry Rawson. Ready now for the women's 400 meter hurdles. The world record 52.94 by, by Marina Stepanova of the Soviet Union. Lane one will be empty here. Kathy Freeman will be in lane two. Sophia Hunter in lane three is a good one to watch. Lane four, Latanya Sheffield. Five, Victoria Fulcher, Shawanda Williams in lane six, another one to watch, and Kelly Roberts and Janine Vickers, the last two, seven and eight, are high school seniors in this race. And truly, the future of America is out there in the outside lanes. <coughs> Lisa Knowles, by the way, is a scratch. You saw her up on the graphic, just to let you know she will not be competing here today. There you see in your screen, that's Latanya Sheffield in lane five, running for the West. She was ranked number five in America last year at this event. Also, Shawanda Williams out in lane six is someone to watch. Let me correct that. That's lane four to watch for Latanya Sheffield right there. Lane six will have Shawanda, who was ranked number three in America last year. Ten hurdles, two and a half feet high each. Fair start as Latanya Sheffield and Sophia Hunter in lane four. Latanya Sheffield with the early lead now. Former American record holder leads down the back stretch and she is putting the field away, Larry. Very good for him, Marty. I wonder if she's gone out too hard. She is running like Valerie Briscoe hit hooks did at the 400 meters of the flats. Tremendous lead. Look at this. Now, let's see if she keeps her step down here. She has about 150 meters to go. As they enter the final straightaway, Latanya Sheffield is leading with Shawanda Williams in the green coming up and now in lane three, Sophia Hunter from Delaware State starting to cut her down. Latanya Sheffield holding on. Sophia Hunter coming on for second. The battle for third. Kelly, Kathy Freeman and Shawanda Williams. Close battle for third as Latanya Sheffield, the favorite, comes through 55 60.
just about one second off of her world record, or her American record, which she ran in 1985, Larry. Well, she ran with courage. She did get her steps uh, complicated there with just uh, one hurdle to go, and then she, she missed her steps again on the 10th hurdle. Watch her. She clears this pretty well. She's still in full flight, but when you lose momentum, when the fatigue sets in, you're in big trouble. Watch her mince her steps and almost lose it here, right here. Look at this. Lost her steps completely, and here comes Sophia Hunter on her inside in lane three. However, she still has something left, and Shawanda Williams, uh, let me correct myself, uh, Latanya Sheffield goes on to victory. It's Sophia Hunter for second. And the battle really was for third place. Looks like Shawanda Williams got it, got it but the winner, Latanya Sheffield, with a bold race from the front. The young the young lady from El Cajon ran well. We had unofficially 55 seconds. 55 seconds, 6,100. Sophia Hunter and Kathy Freeman will get third. Just edging out Sophia Hunter. Um, I'm sorry, just asking, edging out Kathy Freeman. Go now to the hammer, Doug Gilliard, for his fourth throw in the competition. Doug Gilliard is a hammer He's from Los Gatos, California. That throw, 214 feet, four inches for Doug Gilliard. And next up will be Lance Steele, the man who came in with the longest personal best in the competition as we take one more look at Doug Gilliard. Notice the difference in shoes. He chooses that for grip and also comfort. He did not use, if you notice, the entire seven-foot circle that he's entitled to. Look at Deal. Better spin across that circle. Now he's out close to 240 feet, 80 yards downrange on a football field with just seven feet of space to work on. Deal, 238. He threw 248, 11 at our national championships. Just missed making our team in the world championship. Watch the spins across the circle. He's got four turns. He will be, by the third spin, 50% faster than his first turn. You try and build up your momentum and stay in control. Everything in track and field is quickness or speed. So he goes on to improve later in the competition to 239.9. Jim Driscoll got second. Mike Fritchman was third in a good hammer competition. We will be back with more from Wallace Wade Stadium and some great track and field competition a little bit later on. We're in the second rotation of the women's gymnastics all-around competition here at the Smith Center in Chapel Hill. Tim Brando along with Bart Cotter. Joyce Wilborn, our leader after the first rotation, on the uneven bars, and she said all along she needs to become more consistent. Well, we'll see. Yep, and this is a big event for her because it is definitely her weakest event. She can get through this. Oh. Yeah, she did a cast, a reverse pirouette, and she was supposed to go back over the other way. She came down. Okay. Once you're in trouble, it's really hard to regain your composure on a move like that because that was a complete combination, and she missed the first part, and, of course, that really put her in bad position to continue the skill. She has to get back up there. Good free hip, giant swing, pike double back, but that's gonna cost her a lot. That's gonna definitely take her out of the contention in the all-around competition. You get that half point uh, deduction and automatically it's done. Robin Richter now, also on the uneven bars. She looks very good. I've noticed that she looks really aggressive. And of course, uneven bars is her best event. So if she's gonna make a move in the all-around, she can do it right here. A nice cast up to the high bar, free hip right to the top. Giant to a reverse heck, really nice high release move. She fulfills the requirement of going back down and touching the low bar and then casts back up to the top. Giant and a comb in each and a pike dismount. Really clean routine, that's gonna score well. She won and Reno on the uneven bars. Now Sun Janap. On the beam, her best performance was at the American Classic in Colorado Springs in 85. She captured the all-around there. Oh, that's a nice move, a split way out on the end of the beam. She uses a few dance elements.
balance early in the exercise so that she feels comfortable on the beam. Really nice. Swing through layout backflip. I think it's important that the girls use a few dance elements right at the beginning of the exercise so they get a feel of the beam. They sense how nervous they are, how quick they are, so that they can make those proper adjustments to stay on the beam. Oh, and that's a really nice split leap combination. The judges are looking for combinations of dance elements, leap elements, and of course, combination tumbling like that, which is a great back handspring to a layout. She really is competing very well. She looks very confident. She moves quickly, which is nice to see. I think the gymnasts who move quickly seem to really charge and challenge the elements on the balance beam, and I like that style. I think that aggressive style is typical of the Russians and the Romanians. And a round off to a really clean double twist dismount. That's gonna score well, too. So the freshman at Boyertown East Junior High School has an outstanding performance, Sun Janap on the beam. We'll continue with more from gymnastics, but first, let's go over to more track and field here at the U.S. Olympic Festival. We're back at Wade Stadium for the men's 400-meter hurdles, the world and American record, 4702 by Edwin Moses. The festival and stadium records both held by Edwin Moses also. And in lane one tonight, Michael Graham from Los Angeles. Lane two, we'll have Kevin Henderson. Lane three, Patrick Mann national high school record holder in this event nate page is in lane four aaron robinson lane five kevin mason in six harold morton in seven and Trinell hawkins the man with the fastest time in the field is in lane eight well it wasn't until 1956 that 50 seconds was broken and six of the eight in the field marty have run that fast here just this year there you see Trinell Hawkins, number 384 on the outside the young man from angelo state surprised everybody made our olympic team and made the finals but he didn't medal during that competition. 48 and 28 one hundredths of a second. It is his best time. One and a quarter seconds off Moses' world record. Watch him in lane eight. And in lane four in the red shorts, Nat, Nat Page out very quick. Trinell Hawkins, though, at 6'4", 178, leading down the back stretch. Trinell Hawkins with his foot down, just a step after Nat Page in the center of the track. The two men in red from the west battling for the lead. So Hawkins now the leader as they head into the home stretch. Nat Page making a run at him in the center of the track. They've separated themselves from the rest of the field. Hawkins on the far outside, concentrating on form. Page tiring, and Trinell Hawkins will win going away after a quick start. Nat Page, his teammate from West Covina, will get second. And the battle was really for third place as Trinell Hawkins, a member of the Olympic team in 1984, wins here at the festival. Hawkins is unofficial time, 49 and one one hundredth of a second. Look at him, use his arms, help lifting himself over the ninth and tenth hurdles. He saved something for the back stretch and kept building his power, even though they're all fading here down the home stretch. Look at the difference in the gap open up over the last hundred meters. Trinell Hawkins angles over the finish line about three steps ahead of Nat Page. And we saw something we don't often see in hurdles races. He was leading, then he got past in the middle of the turn, and then he came back on at the end to win it, Trinell Hawkins with a great race, and I think third was Kevin Henderson. So Trinell Hawkins wins it, and that page gave him a good run for second. Kevin Henderson will get third in the men's 400-meter hurdles here at Wade Stadium. We'll be back with more track and field here in just a little while. overcome the image that they are too feminine, not strong enough to compete in a sport such as judo. 
Initially, many females take up the sport for self-defense purposes, but they become so committed to judo that the competition becomes the priority. At first, I was um, underestimated a lot when I first began to compete because I was cute and blonde and things like that. But then my um, first instructor told me a very important thing, and it's that judo means the gentle way. And that's that technique can overcome strength. So all these masculine women, these people who look like bruisers, like they bench press more than my weight and things like that, we've learned that finesse can overcome it. And femininity does not necessarily mean that we're ineffective. 18-year-old Don Rubel, a student at Stevens Institute of Technology in New Jersey, is studying biochemistry, a major that takes just as much discipline and intensity as the sport of judo. And I wish I had the time now, because with studying, um, I don't always have the time that I would like to devote to judo. And I also, ha I also tutor. I have a few students whom I tutor during the year, and I also work. <laughs> so I'd like to devote a little more time than I do. Carol Scheid competes in the plus 72 kilo or over 158 pound women's division. The mother of two, she along with her husband, lives on and operates an 850 acre farm in Nevada, Iowa. Carol took six years off from national judo competition to raise her family. The road back to national prominence has been a difficult one, but the rewards are evident. Well, I had a few years between kids where I was active on a local level. So I wasn't coming totally back. But it's been a real thrill for me to come this far and to place at nationals and then be invited here. It was something I did not expect to do. A pretty blonde co-ed and a working mother of two. Two excellent examples of why the fairer sex can establish its presence in a very physical and demanding sport. Well, for those of you that might have thought judo was a little bit like splintering boards in Friday night kung fu theater, it might surprise many of you to learn that it actually means giving way or gentleness. It was founded by Dr. Kano way back in 1892, and it was designed to uh, provide welfare and mutual benefit for all. And of course, if you participate in judo, you benefit from the recreation as well as from the discipline, both physical discipline and mental discipline as well. We were taking a look at some of the women involved. A young woman named Robin Taylor, you might remember that name because she won a couple of medals in the past at the Olympic Festival. Well, she was not really coming here this year. She had taken a year off to start raising a family, made a last minute decision to show up and managed to come in here and win a medal in the 106 pound class. So women uh, have done very well in judo, continue to do so, big sport. On guard. I don't think so. <laughs> Okay, we're going to take a break now. Be, be back with more track and field, more gymnastics in just a moment. Stay with us as the 1987 Olympic Festival continues. Coming up this Tuesday night, top-ranked boxing returns, this time from Valley Hotel and Casino on the boardwalk in Atlantic City. John Meekins, who is 15-1-2 with 12 knockouts out of Manhattan in New York, up against a uh, junior welterweight that is yet to be determined, and Edward Parker against Harold Knight out of Plainfield, New Jersey. Already in the women's 400, Latana Sheffield, age 23, out of El Cajon, California, gets the gold. And in the men's, Tranel Hawkins out of 400 in the men's. Back to track and field. Thanks, Jim. We're ready now for the women's 200 meter, the world record 21-71, held jointly by Marita Koch and Heike Dressler of the German Democratic Republic. And starting in lane one here, we will have Carla McLaughlin. In lane two, Rochelle Stevens. In lane three, Randy Givens, who ran for Florida State. Lane four, Ken Dumlap. Then at Young will be in lane five. Six will be Sonia Friday. In lane seven, the Olympic gold medalist Valerie Briscoe Hooks and in lane eight, Bridget Tate. Well, she's 27 years of age, that woman in your screen. She turned 27 two weeks ago and she ran in a remarkable race in our national championships. She went past her 200 meters in 22 and 5 tenths of a second and tried to run another one. And she, somebody handed her the old proverbial piano, Marty, with about 100 meters to go, and she missed making our world championship team that will compete in Rome. I think this and is an important race for her. She definitely has the speed this year. She didn't seem to have the strength to go the 400 meters at the TAC meet. Maybe here she's trying to make a decision. 
Uh, if well, if uh, Evelyn Ashford is not healthy, maybe she can move down to the 200 meters. Well, it's redemption time for a major mistake. I mean, she went out too fast. There you see in lane three, that is Randy Givens, who is an Olympic finalist uh, and has run 22-2. Now, mind you, that's only three-tenths of a second, four-tenths of a second behind the American record set by Valerie Briscoe Hooks of 21 and 81 one-hundredths of a second. So put another way, she tried to run 400 meters, a full lap around the track. That woman right there I'm talking about, Briscoe Hooks, and she went by her 200 meters within eight-tenths of one second of the world record for that distance, and you can't go out that fast. And well, as you said, mistake. she ran 22.5 on the way to 400 meters. She has the festival record at 20. 22.57, so we probably will see a festival record here tonight. The turns on this track, which is a very good track, the turns, though, are fairly tight, and this is the event where it will affect the event the most, but the, the temperature and everything let me add here this is also. Now, very good for sprinting right now. Excuse me, Marty, we're talking about tight turns here. We should also add that Valerie Briscoe has gotten lane seven, which is one of the two most gradual in the whole turns, and I think she it's a gentle turn, and I think it gives her every, every opportunity to run well. And Valerie is in lane seven because Evelyn Ashford, either because her injury is not healed enough or needs extra training time, pulled out of this race at the last minute Gwen Torrance was expected to give Valerie a good race but we understand that she has not made it here from a meet in Rome so Valerie can pretty much run this race the way she would like to I think but she's got to be a little shaken up you know Randy Givens could give her a good race if she doesn't run good tempo she made a mistake in tack and if she does it here I guess she's become human well I'll be surprised if she doesn't take it out from the gun I expect her to have a lead by halfway through the turn and that woman right there is, I think, anxious to run well. She will possibly be on our 4 by 400 meter relay re team in Rome. She may make the team in the 400 meter relay distance. 4 by 400, she will not make it in an individual race unless injuries occur. Uh, but obviously, she's toning herself up here, long range, for the Olympics. As they are introducing right now, uh, the announcer, Bob Hurst, just introduced Valerie Briscoe. The stadium, by the way, here holds 33,000 people. They've got 10,000 in attendance. It doesn't look quite filled, of course, because they've got 23,000 people masquerading as empty seats here. But the attendance continues to grow here. Tomorrow night is expected to be larger, and they expect over 20,000 here for the finals. On Sunday. And the crowd here seems to know track and field well. There have been some top flight meets here, and anyone who comes away from this meet with a stadium record will have to run a pretty good race or throw an implement pretty far because some of the top people in the world over the past 10 years have been here to Wallace Wade Stadium as we look now at Bridget Tate in lane eight, and they're off. Valerie Briscoe hooks on the left of the screen, already leading the race by a large margin in lane seven. Valerie Briscoe running away from the race. Randy Givens in lane three, giving her chase. Briscoe out quickly, but the field not giving up as the race for second changes drastically at the end. And Randy Gibbons will be pushed back to third place, I believe. Well, two things struck me about that race. You haven't really even seen her smile yet. There's the first smile. She crossed the line seriously. She leaned at the tape. She drove hard from the beginning. She was here to prove something. Note the arm action. Watch her lean at the tape. She runs all the way through. You youngsters out there do that. Too many sprinters don't. Watch her come up to the tape and dip down and lean forward. No competition, but she still reaches for the best time she can get. Here she is, Givens on the inside, also in red in lane three. The rest of the field giving chase. Look at her coming forward. Valerie Briscoe Hooks starts on her way to redemption here at the Olympic Festival, Wade Stadium, and Duke University. Welcome back to the women's all-around competition after two rotations. Dana Lister, the... Young lady we mentioned at the very top of our telecast, right now in first, Juliet Bangreder, only 13 years of age. In second, Tanya Service. She's a veteran here, and Robin Richter is in fourth. Tim Brando along with Bart Connor. And Bart, we all know that there is a certain element of danger in gymnastics, and for that matter, in any element 
of sport. And we all have a collective sigh of relief now for the end result of what was a scary situation. And this was for a Karen very Turney. scary situation. This is a round off flip flop vault, and you'll see here she totally misses her hands. And boy, there is nothing you can do when you don't get that very important block on the horse. Now, there's some good news here, though. She's leaving now. She's scratched from the competition, leaving with her doctor under his urgency, obviously. But she came back with her second vault and scored a 9-1 after having been on the mat for about 10 minutes. What a terrific show of determination. That vault is scary because there's very little room for error. I'm glad she handled it well on the second time around. Juliet Bangerter now in the floor exercise. 13 having, years of age as well. She's having a terrific day. You can see she has... Really nice extension, good presentation, really pretty moves in her dance elements. Here's the tumbling, round of flip-flop, tuck double back. Now once again, you can see that she doesn't do the most high-level difficulty. That tuck double back is a rather common first tumbling run, but what she does, she does so well. Really nice pirouette in the straddle position. Look at that 180-degree split in the legs. I have to admit, she's very much like the style of gymnast that I was. She has good presentation, doesn't do all the big moves, but she has a good presentation, and that will score big points. Nice triple twist. That was an important element for her to do in her second tumbling run. Smooth, cool, and confident, right? Oh, that's a neat move. Double turn into a handstand pirouette. Pretty ballet turns. Junior, she shows a tremendous amount of clean technical elements, which is very important for the junior gymnast because you can always add the difficulty and the big tricks later, but it's very difficult to go back and relearn some of the important technical elements like triple turns like that and tremendous flexibility. She seems quite polished, Juliet Bangerter. Four feet, 11 inches tall, 84 pounds. And right now, she's in second place after two rotations. She probably didn't hurt her standing at all with that performance. Now, Joyce Wilborn, who obviously ran into some problems on the uneven bars in her last rotation. Getting ready to go on the beam. She dropped from first to 15th after that really rough performance on the uneven bars. An 8.35, and when you've scored a 9.85 and you're in first, that, that has to hurt your psyche. Let's see what happens here on the beam. And there's a pirouette to a handstand. and a... She lowers down to sort of a semi-plange position. Okay, now she's getting ready for... Switch leg split leaps. There's that leap series. Something that the judges are definitely looking for is good combination in leaps, good combinations in tumbling. And here's the com tumbling combinations. Two flip-flops to a layout. Really well done. Joyce is so explosive that, and so dynamic that she's had a problem staying on the balance beam. As we noticed before in her vault, she is so springy, it's hard for her to control the landings, and she tends to just go flying off the balance beam. But so far, she seems very much in control here. There's a kick over front. Not an easy move. It'd be nice to see a little more fluid movements fluid body movements and fluid arm movements to contribute to the exercise, but there's a tuck double back and a nice dismount. She's really pleased with that one. So much uh, athleticism in that 100-pound body, it's difficult to control. Joyce Wilborn from Patterson, New Jersey, and she's happy about that dismount, if nothing else, Bart. Sanja Knapp now onto the floor exercise. Sanja's been working the full twisting double back for a mount. She has been improving her difficulty in the last year or so. And let's see if she can pull it off. This is a big trick for her right at the top. She's got good speed. Pull in. Nice. That was really well done. Clean in the air and a great job handling the landing. Fourth after two rotations, she could move into the metal 
category with a great performance here. Beautiful pirouettes. Notice the dramatic change in the music. She started with some very hot, high tempo, fast tempo music, and now she back off, backs off. Ready for a really clean double twist. She probably could use a little more difficulty in that second tumbling run. The double twist, however, was done really high, good form, nice execution, which is very important. She works back into the corner for her last tumbling run, and you can see she's catching a deep breath. Probably will be a tuck double back. Let's see, round up, 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 tuck double. Oh, nice landing. She's going to be pleased with that one. A crowd-pleasing performance from Sun Janab after having been diagnosed with scoliosis for a year. That back problem saw no signs of lack of flexibility in that floor exercise to Sunday. Now, Dana Lister in first place after two rotations on the ball. And this is her weakest event, so if she's going to do well here, she's got to get by this one. Nice work on a laid out Sukahara from a round off approach. Really good ball. So Dana Lister should stay in first place after three rotations as gymnastics continues here at the U.S. Olympic Festival. Ready now for the men's 200 meters, the world record, 19 seconds, 72 100s, held by Pietro Menea of Italy. And starting in lane one, Danny Peebles from North Carolina State. In lane two, Greg Barnes, Miami, Florida. Willie Jones will be in lane three. Lane four, Robert Hackett, the big ten. This is a key, key moment for this youngster from Scottsdale, Arizona. Okay, I believe she's doing one of the round-off approach vaults. Nope. She changed her mind. She's going to do a Pike Sukahara. Now, that vault isn't one of the highest difficulty-rated vaults, so it's going to be hard to score really well there. But she did have decent post-flight and a pretty good height. The thing that you have to keep in mind is Robin Richter will be on the floor. That's one of her stronger disciplines. There's the push off the horse. She's in good position in the Pike Sukahara, one step on the landing. Not an unbelievably high vault, but a clean vault. It'll score decent. Now, the best score is the one that counts. This is her second vault coming up. And Barth, this is really the first time she's been in this position. She's right now in second, has a chance to win. She knows that Richter has the lead, and she's moving on to one of her favorite exercises. And she's going to try, I believe she's going to try the round-off approach vault now. This is a new vault for her, so she's got to put it together if she wants to stay in the running here. And I know this is a little bit scary for this young girl because there is a big crowd, there's a lot of commotion. It's important that she sticks with it. Got to believe that any one of four still have an opportunity to win this all around. But Richter's in a great spot and Juliet must know that. Okay, here we go. There it is, round off approach. And of course, short. That's going to hurt your ankles a little bit as well as your score and your pride. But she did give it a whirl. It's a new vault for her. And she's shaking it off too. She has good speed here. Here's the round off onto the board. Good position. She doesn't get her hands on the horse soon enough with enough time to block. And of course, when you're that short of rotation, <laughs> she knows she missed up, messed up there. Tanya Service now in fifth after three rotations oh. on the uneven bar. And she missed right off the bat. That mount, she was supposed to go into a release move. Now she's going to have to continue the exercise and try and pick up where she left off. Here's the giant swings. Okay, there's a move called a Delchev. Invented by a famous Bulgarian male gymnast, Stoyan Delchev. Okay, she does the requirement for working on the low bar. Back up to the giant swings. Oh, short on that giant swing. She's not going to make it over. Now she is really having trouble in this exercise. She's going to do a pullover, get back up. 
to the high bar. She's got to make this dismount. Toe on, front off, and short. Boy, Nick Reigns, of course. Trying to make a comeback from a compound fracture of her right ankle. Had six pins installed. Tanya Service having difficulty. Women's gymnastics continue a bit later here on the Olympic Festival. You're looking at Robin Richter, 15 years old from Lincoln, Nebraska, in first place after three rotations, now with an opportunity for a gold medal performance here in the floor exercise as she goes for the all-around gold. And I just don't see how she can lose it. She is really very good on the floor. She has a nice, spunky style. And this is a big moment for her because you don't often get to a very important event like this in the lead with one of your best to finish on. Okay, here we go. Front step out, round off back handspring, pike double back. Really nice. Front step out, through to a full. Not really the most difficult pass, but of course, no real deduction. She's showing nice combination tumbling. She did front step out into her first tumbling run, front step out into the second one. Really nice pirouettes. Of course, there was the change of the pace of the music, and now she's back to picking up the exercise, ready for a big finish. She is really very aggressive in this competition. She seems so confident. Here she goes, she's burning across there. Tuck, tuck double back, over rotated, one step. But she's gonna be tough to beat. Really a great day for Robin Richter. 10th grader at Bias the 10th High School. She collects bears, she's gonna get a bear hug now from her teammates. She's on her way perhaps to the gold in the all around competition, but we still have some outstanding competitors that could be in her way. We've had a very balanced field here, Bart. We knew it coming in, but I don't think we anticipated 65 one hundredths of a point to separate the top seven here. Robin is one of those gymnasts that we mentioned at the top. When she is on, she can be really spectacular. Here's her first tumbling run. There's a front step out, nice rotation. Sets her up into the round off back handspring. This is a tough pass. There's up, pike double back, two times around, and really handles the landing. She knows she has it. Okay, here's the ending of her exercise. She finishes the double back. She finishes in a nice pose, and she knows she's got it. Now onto the floor is Joyce Wilborn who had a great start and ran into problems on the uneven bars. Where do you see this routine? This is so wild. She has a terrific style, outstanding music, and outrageous tumbling. Front step out, run up, flip flop, full in. <laughs> I talked about the level of difficulty. You've got to do the big tricks, and Joyce does them. you got to love this exercise. All right. She's in her element now, and the crowd loves it. Okay, now here's her second tumbling run. Usually she just does a double twist here. I don't know why she does that. I think she can actually do more difficult. It looked like it was so easy for her. She needs to do a bigger tumbling run there. But as you see, she gets back into the dance. A little moonwalk. <laughs> Go for it, Joyce. She really does have an ability because of that music and because of her dance style to get the crowd into her performance. And let me tell you, when you get in this part of the routine, she gets ready for her last tumbling run. Usually she does a full twisting double here. She needs the support of that crowd. There we go. Oh, just a tuck double back, but so high, over rotated. Really nice exercise. Look out for her come Sunday. There are several individual gold medals that could be on the way for Joyce Wilborn from Patterson, New Jersey. I'd say she's the crowd favorite right now, and she's in ninth place in the all-around.
Even the guys like it, and why not? Because most of these guys can't do a routine. They'll be practicing their, their moonwalks in the Olympic Village here in Carolina a little bit later tonight. Okay, on the last tumbling run, she does a tuck double back. Usually she does, and probably in the finals we'll see a full twisting double back. Look at how high she is. Most people can't tumble that high at the beginning, and she blows them away at the end. The crowd reacting to a 9.9 for Joyce Wilborn in the floor exercise. Now, some Janak tied for second place going into the last rotation. Okay, there's a laid out Sukahar and a really nice stick on the landing. That's going to score well. The gold medal will be given out shortly in the women's gymnastics all around. We'll have it for you when we return to the Dean Dome. We're joining the women's 3,000 meters with just over two laps to go. The lead has just been Brenda Webb from the gun. She's still leading now as she tries to pull away from the kick of Lynn Jennings, Larry, and Lynn is in third place right now. Annie Schweitzer has moved up into second place. Let's give you a quick recap. 71 seconds for the first 400 meters. 223 through the half mile, 449 by the mile mark. We have a lap and a half to go, and it is Brenda Webb, the veteran from Knoxville, Tennessee, who's been on many a national team here trying to pull away. She realizes that she has speed right behind her, and the presence of Lynn Jennings who's moved into second, Annie Schweitzer in third, and the net hand, all fine, 5,000 meter runner. First of all, I'm a horse trainer. And second of all, I really enjoy the education process of both the horse and the rider. And for me to win the team dressage title, the individual competition is taking place this very evening. And the importance of that is that the top four riders, the top four dressage riders at the festival competition will go on to represent the United, to represent the United States at the Pan American Games. So it is a pretty big deal for them. The interesting thing, if you talk to the dressage athletes, they will tell you that they just go out there and they do what they do. The real athlete is the horse. <laughs> Well, it's an interesting partnership between the two, of course, because you can have a rider who is at the absolute best in his field, the top of his game, but the rider is nothing without the partner, the horse, who has got to be equally talented and equally in sync. And, of course, they're very subtle signals given by the wrists and the hands, the thighs and the ankles to the horse to perform the various tricks of dressage. Any breed of horse is eligible as far as the festival and the Olympics, but for the most part, American horses, especially thoroughbreds, and European breeds have dominated in most recent years. You might recall in Houston, over 4,500 fans jammed in to watch the dressage events, and they could have sold double the seats had they been available. So at the festival here, the dressage events are underway. Four days of competition, just horsing around. So to speak. And we're going to continue horsing around in our sports center, in our uh, Olympic festival coverage. We're going to take a break and be back with some more, with some Taekwondo for you right after this. Stay with us. I can tell you, because I've been to Cooperstown on Hall of Fame Day, that is a very special day. It's a very community-oriented event, and for the inductees, it's something that they obviously have waited for all of their lives, voted in and surrounded by their peers. Also going into the Hall of Fame this year, our broadcaster friend from KMOX in St. Louis, Jack Buck, elected into the Broadcasters Hall of Fame as far as baseball is concerned. Some people said that the reason Harry Carey had his heart attack was Jack Buck... You make use of the rules very well. Now, the roles of the coaches, they're sitting, uh, maybe not so calmly, on the sideline. You look at Naeem Hassan, look back at his coach. Is the, are the coaches allowed to coach during the match? Well, actually, technically, you know, they are not, but the good experienced competitor can look at a coach, and a coach can wave a hand in a certain way, you know, kind of getting signals from third base, like in baseball. In that case, Mr. Chung from Denver, you know, put his hand in an up-down motion, saying, signaling that axe kick, and saying, you know, Naeem, when he moves in with that punch, hit him with that axe kick. One minute, good back kick. You get a good really back kick and a good roundhouse by Naeem. Really, here the, the slap of the foot and the, and, the, and the punches against the protector gives you an idea, if you're in the crowd, of the tremendous force delivered by these fellows. Yeah, and once again, those chest protectors look like they're offering a lot of protection, but I dare say that the rib wrap 
that's used by, you know, football players is much greater. Really? Much better protection than these chest protectors. Although these do look, you know, like more protection. They're not flak jackets, in other words. Oh, these, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Fifteen seconds left to go on this last round for Naeem Hassan and Steve Dorschorst with a gold medal in the middleweight division here at the Taekwondo competition, which will continue on Saturday night here in Raleigh. Well, even though Mr. Dorschorst is down three to nothing, I must say I'm very impressed in this fight against Naeem. He did a great job. And the crowd showing their appreciation as the final buzzer sounds. And in just a few moments, the gold medal will be decided in the middleweight division. Naeem Hassan taking his helmet off. Steve Dorshores chooses to leave his on. And there you see the judges coming from the four corners, delivering their slips to the man in charge of the bout at the center. And he'll walk them over to the jury table. Let's take a look back at some of the excellent action we saw. OK, now there's Dorshores faking with his head. He moves in. Naeem hits him with a back kick on the arm. Dorshores then moves in. Naeem moves back, throws a roundhouse, and then they move into a clinch. But Dorsha says, I'm still going to try and kick him, and tries to bring his left leg up in a crescent-type kick. And the scoreboard showing 3 nothing coming into that round in favor for Naeem Hassan. There is uh, not much to Spence who is going to win the gold medal here. It's more or less a formality. And Naeem Hassan, for the record now, is the gold medal winner at the U.S. Olympic Sports Festival in the middleweight division. Coming down from the heavyweight, he was very impressive indeed. Steve Dorshore is the game opponent, but Hassan was the best out here this evening. So the crowd at the Raleigh Civic Center applauding the efforts of Naeem Hassan and Steve Dorshore will be back a little bit later on. The 1987 U.S. Olympic Festival is brought to you by... The Miller Brewing Company, sole sponsor of the U.S. Olympic Training Centers. Honda, who invites you to experience the new Prelude SI at your local Honda dealer. The Coca-Cola Company, and local Coca-Cola bottler of Coca-Cola Classic. Back live at Wallace Wade Stadium on the campus of Duke University, site of the Olympic Festival track and field events. They are nearing the finish of the men's 10,000 meters. Let's join Mike Patrick, Marty LaCroix, and Larry Rawson for the completion of that race. Thank you, Gail. We're joining the 10,000 meters just as Bobby Hodge moves into the lead with Jim Hill in the red of the West, moving into second place. Danny Gonzalez in third had been leading for the last three laps and the race is heating up with three laps to go let's take a minute just to bring you up to date earlier we had some terrific running in the 200 meters in the men's race thomas jefferson the bronze medalist from los angeles 20.38 tim williams and harvey mcswain were second and third and then in the women's 200 a last minute change to the 200 for valerie briscoe pays off in a festival and a stadium record and then another stadium record and festival record by Lynn Jennings, Brenda Webb, and Annette Hand were second and third. As we will now go back to the men's 10,000 meters with two and a half laps to go, Larry. Bobby Hodge leading from Jim Hill, who has a terrific kick, I think. Jim Hill ran 56 for the last quarter of a 5,000 a few years ago. I don't think Bobby Hodge has that kind of speed, but you know him better. Well, we're seeing a return. First of all, let me add this. This is a race between a marathoner and a three-miler. The 5,000-meter man is stalking the marathoner, and Bob Hodge in the lead has run 2.11 for the marathon. He finished sixth this past a year ago in the Boston Marathon, 1986. He's a tough runner, but he knows he's got speed right on his back in the presence of Jim Hill, who is ranked number three in the world at 5,000 meters and number three in America at 10,000 in 1983. 27 minutes even with two laps to go. Hodge leading from Jim Hill, and I guess Danny Gonzalez in third there is the unknown quantity. Hill, we know, as you said, I think he's got a great kick. Bobby Hodge led early on in the race in the first two miles, dropped back, and now he's made his way to the front as Gonzalez is going to be the first one to move. 600 meters to go from Jim Hill in red. Bobby Hodge sandwiched in between the two runners from the west. The They've been... 5,000 meters was covered unofficially in 14 minutes, 29 seconds. The temperature about 82 degrees. It's probably close to that from a humidity standpoint. The air is still. So it's warm. You can see the perspiration all over these men as they will cover 6.2 miles on the track. Gonzalez from San Jose State 
in the lead. He graduated a year ago from there. Bobby Hodge, here comes Hill, trying to put pressure on. One to go, Marty. 70 seconds for that lap. They've been running close to 70 seconds every lap, so the lead was changing, but the pace did not pick up as Jim Hill now takes off with 400 meters to go. With 300 to go, he's pulling away as Bobby Hodge and Gonzalez are doing a good job of keeping up but Jim Hill is in full flight. You can see his stride. Larry is just the stride of a miler. As we look at Bobby Hodge, who has the stride of a marathoner, and Danny Gonzalez hanging on for third. Doug Collison is just off the pace in fourth, as Jim Hill is going to win this one looking back. Jim Hill from Eugene, Oregon, went to the University of Oregon, ran 5,000 meters for them. A four-minute miler in his day, and Bobby Hodge in the back there is going to have a tough time holding on for second place as Jim Hill wins it his last lap, about 67 seconds. Danny Gonzalez will pip Bobby Hodge for second, and Doug Tollison will get fourth here at the festival. A sub-60-second last quarter for Jim Hill as he is beginning to show the flashes of brilliance that people expected when he ran so well as just a junior at the University of Oregon under the guidance of Bill Dellinger. Very fine battle for second as you saw as Danny Gonzalez came up. He came into the race and he may have actually got his personal best or something very close to it in this race as Bobby Hodge just gets eked out for second by Danny Gonzalez from San Jose. Hodge gets third and the rest of the field was Freddie Gilby Hyde. Very fine time in a hot, humid night. Let's go down now to Mike Patrick on the field. Thanks very much, Larry and Marty. Among the events we'll be covering for you tomorrow, the men's 100 with Calvin Smith, a gold medalist on one of the American relay teams in Los Angeles. We'll also see the women's 100 with American champion Diane Williams. She has the potential to be the fastest American female ever, and she'll lead the American delegation to the world championships in Rome later this summer. Also, the triple jump with world outdoor record holder Willie Banks. Former Olympic champion Al Joyner is also in the field tomorrow. And the pole vault, where we'll have six men in the field who have marks of 18 feet or better. And we hope you'll join us for coverage of those events tomorrow on ESPN. For Larry Rawson and Marty LaCorey and our entire crew, this is Mike Patrick. So long from track and field. We're going to take you back to Taekwondo. That became a festival sport in 1985, and we always keep talking about the 34 sports in the festival. Well, that was the 34th sport that was added, and you mentioned earlier that judo meant the gentle way. Well, Taekwondo means the way of smashing <laughs> with hand and foot, and mostly it's foot, because unlike uh, karate and kung fu, the, the emphasis here is on the kick, and you get more points for you know, hitting with kicking combinations than you do with punching combinations. You have so. studied this thoroughly. This is I becoming love it. One it's my favorite, favorite right? sport. A gold medal to be <laughs> awarded next. Brian Parker, 22 out of Ohio State, a phys ed major, up against Brian Parker. He's 19 from Denver and a pre-med student. If he doesn't stay out of the way, he'll need a graduate student. We are set for second round action, the gold medal match for the lightweight gold medal in the sport of Taekwondo here from the Raleigh Civic Center. It is Greg Baker in the blue, Brian Parker in the red. Again, I'm with Michael Weintraub, the executive director of the U.S. Taekwondo Union. Michael, for those again tuning in late, just joining us, the scoring. How is it determined? The scoring will be done by blows delivered with trembling shock, which implies that the person being hit will actually tremble from the very force of the blow. Kicking can be accomplished to the chest protector area, which includes the floating ribs, and of course to the head, including knockouts to the body and head. Kicking in combination, scoring trembling shock, will also give a point. There we saw a half point deduction. The referee gave a half point deduction for moving out of bounds to Greg Baker, the reluctance to fight, perhaps due to that earlier injury. Because Greg normally is not reluctant to fight at all. Punching is allowed to the body. Very difficult to score trembling shock with a punch with the chest protectors on but very possible. We'll see a middleweight match with Naeem Hassan, oh. who certainly can score a scrambling shot with his punch. He is a heavy hitter, let me tell you that. Now, Greg Baker, again, acting a little bit perturbed if you read his face with his opponent, Brian Parker. 
Yeah, Greg again, experienced nationally, internationally. At this point, he's got to be thinking, I got to start picking up the action. But it is second round. He can afford to coast here a little bit. The question is whether he wants to. Very interesting. Greg, I think the stronger of the two, certainly the taller of the two, and he's got to be the more experienced. Been a U.S. team member a couple times, fought in World Championships, World Cup. But uh, Brian Parker doesn't seem to notice. <laughs> no, he doesn't. No respect shown it. Well, respect, but there's no, uh, he's not going to be tremble. He's not going to tremble in that respect. In this yeah, he's certainly respect. not hesitating at no. this point. Of course, Greg Baker in the blue, the defending festival champion in the lightweight division, as well as national champion this year. So he's not going to let a thing like a sore back, if he can at all help it keep him out of the fray here. No, he was uh, defeated by Steve Kapner out of Bozeman, Montana, student of team captain Jay Warwick, who is a student of head coach Master Sang Lee, who's a Pan Am Olympic coach. But Steve Kapner beat him at the Pan Am trials, but Greg Baker is the national champion. He is the national champion in the men's lightweight. So looking for a back kick, comes back with a front kick. Baker leading one to nothing after the first round, according to the scoreboard. Yeah, Greg, is, Greg is, is feeling his back injury. You can tell the way he's moving, but look at this. Beautiful. And he goes right after Parker, even in the yellow zone, as the referee calls him back to the center of the match. Yeah, Young and Lee is doing a good job controlling the match, uh, but so is Greg Baker. And Brian Parker, good enthusiasm, good speed, but lacking a little bit in experience here. Baker looks physically like he's played a little football, and he has in the past played high school football in Columbus. Great Taekwondo contingent in Ohio, Bozeman, Colorado Springs, and uh, of course, uh, the wrestling and grappling you see throwing is, is no part of Taekwondo, and uh, will in this particular case, because it wasn't flagrant, result in a simple continuation of the action. And the action will pause for one minute as we've reached the end of the second round. This is the gold medal match. In the lightweight division of Taekwondo, Greg Baker from Columbus, Ohio, Brian Parker from Denver, Colorado, close indeed. We'll be back for the third and final round. At stake here at the Raleigh Civic Center in just a moment will be the gold medal of the lightweight division of the Taekwondo competition. Tom Mees along with Michael Weintraub. We're at the side of the mat. The action happening right in front of us. This is third round competition. The scoreboard has the competitor in blue, Greg Baker, leading 1.5 to nothing at this point. And Baker took a hard punch to the rib area, it appeared, from Brian Parker in the rim. And he is feeling that. Yeah, remember we saw that the referee before moved his hand to the side and he gave a kyungo. A kyungo being a warning, which is good for a half a deduction point. So when you say the score is 1.5, that's where the point five came from. When the referee moves his hand above his head mm -hmm. and indicates a gum jump, that will be a full deduction point. As we mentioned earlier, French is the international language for fencing, Korean the international language here at Taekwondo. And Ryan Parker's going to score a point as he sends Greg Baker tumbling to the mat. Well, it seemed to me that uh, Brian went to the mat too. That might be questionable. It'll be interesting to see how the refs score that one. I made a basic mistake there, anticipating what the referee would call. But you make a good point because you have to maintain your balance. Yes, it was. And there was the Kyungo warning we just talked about this time to Brian Parker. Mandatory half-point deduction. And that time was for falling, for grabbing. <laughs> Greg Baker anticipating which direction Parker's going to move and leading him with that kick. Now you see the competitor. Watch Greg's <laughs> oh. That was good by Brian. Good quick left leg roundhouse to counter Greg's back kick. But I'll tell you, look at that, right by the head. Beautiful kick by Greg. Good movement by Brian, great instinct. If that would have landed, this match would be over. Uh, Maybe over. Greg's got a hard hit. <laughs> <laughs> now again, Greg, Greg Parker bending over and wincing in pain. Or the Greg, I'm sorry, Greg Baker. Bending over wincing in pain, Brian Parker delivering a blow. A tribute to the athletes, you know, is Greg Baker. He's a representative of U.S. Taekwondo. Great spirit, great courage, great respect. And yet, uh, you know, I, I think we got a gold medalist here. Mm. Now, the U.S. Olympic Festival Taekwondo uh, competition, would we see any of these competitors this coming uh, summer in, in Seoul? Oh, yes, definitely. I think that all competitors here you know, they all got to the Pan Am trials. They're all top finishers at the trials. 
and uh, any of these people can certainly be on it. Greg Baker, you know, Greg's got a good chance. Greg's a fine competitor, and he's a fine person, too. So this is definitely one of the sports where the Olympic Festival is a, is a prime proving ground for folks you may see in action during the 88 games in Seoul. Yeah, and I don't certainly mean to be little Brian Parker. He has impressed that, really impressed me today with his movement. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you're talking about somebody who's been on the U.S. team, a national champion, and versus somebody who's a little bit new in the scene. I think we could certainly look for Brian to do, you know, excellent things. He's only 19 years old. He's now training in Denver with Master Chung. And, you know, that can lead to great combination and certainly the Olympics next year. Well, we reached the end of this gold medal match. The crowd showing their approval through their applause. And Greg Baker, of course, he wants to win the match first, but I'll bet you his back is saying, my goodness, it's over. Yeah, but even with that pain, we can see on this replay, watch the Greg, even through the pain. Look at this attack. A roundhouse, he stepped forward, he roundhouses again. Look at this aggression. Brian tries to counter and... Greg just steps in with a reverse punch. I mean, just great aggression. And Taekwondo, we develop mind and body. And I think that Greg has been a good example of, you know, taking the mental power to bypass the physical pain and bring it together for a great Taekwondo competitor. And Greg certainly is. Uh, he's waiting at the center of the mat while Brian Parker will be out there with him shortly. The referee is consulting with the jurors. Got to give Greg Baker the nod. You know, playing with pain, they say, is the key to great competitors in many sports and taekwondo is no exception he put on quite a show as did brian parker i think this i'm impressed with parker's agility and baker's aggressiveness very good match and here obviously the winner greg baker and a great decision absolutely he wins it 2.5 to the plus side to a minus 0.5 for brian parker yes that was that was uh, due to the deductions that uh brian got for grabbing and low kicking etc but, um, you know, Brian did very well, but Greg Baker was guaranteed over there because great attacking. So Greg Baker from Columbus, Ohio, not just the gold at the Olympic Sports Festival, Taekwondo, lightweight division competition, Brian Parker will get the silver. We'll be back with more action for the Raleigh Civic Center in a few moments. A crowd of better than 14,000 were quite boisterous tonight as the women's gymnastics all-around competition concluded. And the future is indeed bright. We found that much out. Take a look at our winners. The gold medal goes to Robin Richter. Dana Lister out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, gets the silver and Sunjanap the bronze. Tim Brando along with Bart Connor and our gold medalist Robin Richter. And Robin, you did win an all-around competition in 86 at Reno, but uh, does that at all compare with this? No, this competition was a lot better and the people helped a lot and I just feel great. You know, earlier, about a month ago, you placed 22nd in the all-around in the U.S. championships, but you were injured going into that event, weren't you? Yes, I broke my arm in January and so I was a little weak coming back and this just gave me more time to be ready and now I was ready and I did it. It was a very exciting competition, but one place where you really jumped into the lead was on balance beam of all things, a 9.7 there. How did that feel? That felt great. Once you hit beam, you just feel like you have it made. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Bart, as you well know, the Shangri-La for any gymnast is to go into their final event with the lead and have the floor exercise, and they're already good at it. Here's the round off flip up double back. It was a very strong finish to a really clean exercise. She pulls it around, takes one step here, but right at this point, she thinks, hey, I got this baby. And the gold medal presentation. Almost as good as the kiss from Bart on both cheeks. And Robin Richter out of Lincoln, Nebraska, is the gold medalist in the women's all-around competition here at the U.S. Olympic Festival. She'll be water skiing soon, and why not? She got the gold. Join Bart and me for the men tomorrow. Back at the Raleigh Civic Center in downtown Raleigh, North Carolina, where the Taekwondo competition is well underway. I'm Tom Mees in company again with Michael Weintraub. We're standing on the mat where four gold medals were decided tonight. They call your sport the sport of the 90s, and after the action we saw, Mike, it's no wonder. Let's begin with the Fenway division, where Juan Moreno actually won, unfortunately for everybody, because of a bow -up. Yeah, Robert Leach from Philadelphia had an injury to his right arm that was major enough that he felt that he should not continue. Uh, Robert has great spirit. Juan Moreno would have been a great match. I think we can look forward to see it in the future. In the Bantamweights, a bit of an upset when you looked at the field coming in. John Beaupre out of Metairie, Louisiana, wins it. Yeah, John is a student at Louisiana State University at Charles Dingman. 
Uh, just a great competitor. People may have thought he was an underdog coming in today, but I don't think anybody will think that in the future. Great competitor. Look for great things. Of course, Han Wan Lee will be back as well as the others. Strong bantamweight in the U.S. Greg Baker wins the uh, division of the lightweights, and he was very impressive indeed. Yeah, he was mostly in attitude, and uh, certainly his physical technique was superb. But to come in and have the mental concentration when you have an injury that was sustained, a tribute to his training partners, his state, and his teacher. Fine and, man, Greg Baker. And last and certainly not least, Naeem Hassan. You're taking a look at some of his winning form, winning the gold medal in the middleweight division. Yeah, well, we were very happy uh, with Naeem. And as we saw, a lot of autographs him being requested. A fine gentleman, a tribute to taekwondo, and really just the kind of person that we like to represent us. Great man, great competitor. And we had great action here tonight, Tom. We sure did, Mike. Thanks for joining me at Matt's side. And we'll be back again for four more gold medal matches as our coverage of Taekwondo, the sport of the 90s, continues on Saturday from the Olympic Festival. Well, from the bumps and bruises of Taekwondo, a sport enjoyed by 20 million people in 130 nations, but just 3,400 participants registered here in the United States back in just 1984. That has since grown to 18,000 with some 800 Taekwondo schools to the grace and elegance and beauty of gymnastics. And, you know, it wasn't too long ago that gymnastics was a relatively unfollowed and unfavored sport here in the United States. The uh, international competition, as far as Americans concerned, they went over and they were thrashed rather regularly by the Soviets and by the Eastern European bloc countries. That perhaps changed. Maybe you could peg the Renaissance to the Olga Corbett era, if you will, and certainly Mary Lou Retton, who began her quest for gold right here at the U.S. Olympic Festival. Last year, names like Phoebe Mills. And, of course, tonight, Joyce Wilburn, who had that standing ovation before almost 14,000. Gymnastics sold out for the next two days here in the Dean Dome, and I think that really says something in this basketball-crazed area known as the Triangle. Of course, tomorrow night, we're going to get a chance to see the men once again, the men's individual competition, and once again look for Neil Palmer out of the University of Nebraska, who did so well. We're going to be on with you tomorrow at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, actually two sessions in the afternoon and in the evening. You will see that men's individual competition. You will also see more track and field, the men's and women's 100 meters, the triple jump and the pole vault as well. You'll also see Jim's favorite synchronized swimming tomorrow afternoon bring so your air please, conditioner yeah, really we'll be outside we'll be back tomorrow at three